Hey guys, and welcome to the last chapter lecture that we'll be doing for microbiology this semester, chapter 21, which is all about diseases, infectious diseases of the genitourinary system. Um, well, the urinary system is pictured here, but it overlaps with the genitalia. So let's um, look at those in just a second. Actually, let's look at them now. Okay, so the male reproductive system anatomy versus the female reproductive system anatomy are pictured here. Um, and also we can see the uh, part of the bladder here up top. So here in the male is the bladder. And um, nope, nope, this is the bladder here. We're shown the muscular layer of it. I'm used to seeing a internal. So this is a, just the peritoneal space in the abdominal cavity. So this shows us the outer muscular lining of the bladder. And here's the ureter that connects from the kidneys up here. And uh, the, the bladder holds the urine. And then here coming out of it is the urethra. It's very long in males because it, it has to go all the way through the length of the penis. This gland right here that surrounds um, this part, the proximal part of the urethra is called the prostate gland, and that's a male-specific gland. Um, you can see here this is the seminal vesicle, which is connected to the testes here and produces a lot of the fluid of the semen, also fuses with the urethra. So both urine and semen um, share the urethra as the, their exit tube. So there's really a lot of overlap in males between the genital system and the urinary system, particularly the urethra. So some of the main parts of the reproductive system, the testes, um, are the gonads, the glands that produce the sperm. Then they swim through the epididymis where they get a swim cap on, I like to say. Um, they get capped with a cap that's made of enzymes that helps them penetrate the egg. Then they flow up through the vas deferens which is the part that gets snipped if you have a vasectomy. And then they hang out in the seminal vesicle waiting for ejaculation, and they ejaculate through the penis. So those are most of the parts of the male reproductive system and how it, it overlaps with the urinary system. Now for the females, okay, over here, here we have the bladder, so we're seeing a cross section of it. Here's the muscular layer. And um, so the urine is stored in here, and then it comes out through the urethra. Um, so right behind the urethra here is the vaginal opening. And this is the vaginal canal, which leads up to the uterus, which is this organ right here, this very muscular organ. So the end of the uterus right here, the neck of the uterus is called the cervix. And there's an opening called the cervical os, or the opening of the cervix. And for, oops, um, in reproduction, the sperm actually enters the uterus and actually will actually swim down the fallopian tubes towards the ovary. Here's the ovary. We can't really see the connection here, but the ovary is connected via the fallopian tubes to the uterus. The eggs are made here, so the ovary is the female gonad, and um, the sperm and egg usually meet somewhere in the fallopian tube, and the egg is fertilized, and then it comes down into the uterus, and it implants here in the uterus and grows. So you can really see nicely how the uterus sits really right on top of the bladder. So in a pregnant female, as this uterus is growing and growing and growing with a developing fetus, you can see why pregnant females need to pee a lot because that uterus really is sitting on top of and pushing on the bladder. So there's not quite as much overlap here in females between the, gen the genital system and the urinary system are separate. There's not any sharing of the urethra but the urethral opening and the vaginal opening are super close together and also not even that far from the anal opening. So we'll talk about in this um, chapter things like urinary tract infections and infections of the vagina, which can be caused by normal flora from the anus, basically contaminating those, those canals. Um, the urethra is much shorter in females because it doesn't have to go through the length of a penis. So it also makes UTIs much more common in females because it's easier for bacteria to get up through the urinary tract. Um, other things I wanted to say a little bit about the vagina. So we're gonna talk about some of the defenses of this system in both males and females. One of the defenses that the vagina has, the vagina has a changing pH over time. So in kids before puberty, prepubescent females, 
uh, have a neutral pH of the vagina. It's populated by certain microbes that keep the pH neutral. And the hormones actually affect the chemistry, the pH as well. But during puberty and changing hormone production, it changes the pH of the vaginal environment, which will also change the microbes that inhabit the, the um, environment. So the normal pH in pubescent females and uh, those of reproductive age tends to be a bit acidic. Um, other things, other life stages and hormonal changes will cause a change in the pH of the vagina. And part of that is to help promote the growth of sort of desired bacteria in the vagina during that life stage. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the defenses now that we've talked about the anatomy. All right, so the defenses of the urinary tract are A, just the flushing action, the fact that you pee several times a day and you're emptying the bladder, you're constantly sort of flushing. So it's kind of hard to colonize the bladder when it's constantly being flush. Um, also, the urinary tract desquamates. I think I said that right. So does your intestinal tract, basically the outer layer of skin, just like your skin on your cell, on your, the cells of your skin are exfoliated, that sort of outer layer is just constantly sort of shed. Same thing happens in the gastrointestinal system and in the urinary system. So that also helps to clear it um, of anything that might bind there. Still, it can become infected. <clears throat> Other defenses of the urinary system and the genital system is the pH. So the urine can be slightly acidic and the vagina can be slightly acidic. You can also find lysozyme, which is an enzyme that breaks down peptidoglycan of cell walls. Um, <clears throat> secretory IgA is found in the mucosal linings of the genital tract, so in the vagina and even in um, like the seminal fluid. You can find uh, IgA, which helps to prevent infection there. Um, with the genital tract, well, the urinary tract in particular, the biggest pathogens that we're gonna find are actually normal flora that get into the wrong place. Genital infections, there are some actual pathogens there. But in the urinary tract, they're more opportunistic, if you will, not in that they make, um, that they only infect immunocompromised people, but they are, there really aren't a lot of, of pathogens that like specifically infect the urinary system, it's mostly sort of accidental infections by normal microbes, is how I'll put it. Okay, so the normal biota of the genitourinary system. So of the urinary tract, um, the lower urinary tract, so basically the outside of the urethra, you've got all the sort of skin, normal skin bacteria. Um, and possibly in the lower part of the urethra, it's normal to find some of these bacteria. All right, there's also lots of normal flora in the female vagina. Um, a lot of lactobacillus, especially after puberty, lactobacillus likes an acidic environment, helps to promote an acidic environment. Um, Candida albicans is yeast. We'll talk about yeast infections. And it's a normal flora, but in yeast, a yeast infection is really a super infection overgrowth of candida. Um, and uh, same thing, so for the men, the, the genital tract might have, um, it's really referring to the urethra. So there is some bacteria that grows just outside the urethra that we see in both males and females. So, but within the genital, within the, the genital urinary tract, so in the uterus, the uterus is thought to be a sterile environment. The cervix, there's a membrane there, it prevents bacteria from going up into the cervix. So any bacteria in there is considered an infection. Same thing with men. The vas deferens, the, so the ure maybe the external part of the urethra has some bacteria in it, but further up the urethra, up to the prostate, the bladder, the seminal vesicle, those are all sterile environments. Um, <clears throat> okay. So this is just the sort of summary slide of this chapter, looking at all the diseases of the genitourinary system. So <clears throat> we have a female and a male, and most of the diseases are the same. A lot of these diseases are not um, 
gender specific, but some of the, or sex specific, I should say, but some of them are. So prostatitis, the prostate is a male organ, so that will be in males only. Um, <clears throat> vagin the vagina is a female organ, so it will be fine. Vaginitis is referring to females only. Um, group B strep, we'll also talk about, is something that can affect newborns. It has to do with pregnancy. And um, so that's a female specific thing as well. So I put asterisks next to the sort of sex specific diseases, but all the others are repetitive on each slide. Um, all righty. So next. <clears throat> all right, we're going to start with urinary tract infections which are super, super common. So the urinary tract, it includes the bladder, the, the urethra, which is that pee tube that extends out of the body, the bladder, which is the sac that holds the urine, the ureters, which are the tubes that connect to the kidney, and the kidneys, which are the organs that actually make the urine. They're sort of the key important part of the urinary system. They do all the work. And then the ureters and the bladder and the urethra are basically just tubes that urine travels down in a tank it gets stored in until you pee it out. So any of those parts can become infected and any of those parts infected is called a UTI, a urinary tract infection. So the most superficial form is urethritis, which would be inflammation or infection of the urethra down here. Cystitis, cyst means a bladder, so that's infection of the bladder. If the bacteria moves up the urethra, maybe an un untreated case can spread to the bladder and it can even spread up the ureters into the kidney itself and called cause pyelonephritis or something else called glomerulonephritis. Nephro means kidney so those are kidney infections and that's the most sort of severe type of urinary tract infection and that can happen if an infection lower in the gas in the in the urinary tract doesn't get treated and ends up progressing. Or sometimes people might have very mild symptoms and so they don't get it treated because they don't realize they're infected. The most common signs and symptoms of a urinary tract infection is pain, painful urination, so it sort of stings or burns when you pee. And the medical term for that is dysuria. And the other one is a frequent urge to urinate. So risking too much information for you, plug your ears if you don't want to hear a personal story about a UTI. My first UTI, was in grad school, I was in my 20s. And so I was, you know, drinking age and I was out with all my friends. We were at a bar and I was drinking lots of beer and I had to go to the bathroom a lot. And one of the times that I was coming out of the bathroom, I said jokingly to my friends, I was like, don't you hate it when you drink so much that you pee and then as soon as you're done peeing, you have to pee again. Like you feel like you just have to pee all the time. And they're like, Sarah, that's not drunk. That's a urinary tract infection. I was like, no, I've just, I've just been drinking a lot of beer. But um, it continued the next day and it was a urinary tract infection. So I called my doctor and I got some antibiotics. So um, it was good that people around me knew that because I didn't know that, that that was what a urinary tract infection felt like. And who knows how many days I would have gone without contacting a doctor. Um, so it's good to know, it's very common. Um, it's a very common infection, and the, the key symptom that you have is just like you, you feel like you constantly need to pee. Even right after you go to the bathroom, you still feel like you need to go, and there's nothing there, but you still feel like you need to go. So if, that, if you have that experience, definitely call your doctor because it could be a UTI. Um, other things, other signs and symptoms uh, could be cloudy urine from bacteria or pus, and hematuria, if it's a really... Um, bad infection, it could actually cause bleeding. Hemato is blood in the urine. You may have fever or nausea, especially if it's a bad infection. If it spreads up to the kidneys, kidney pain is often experienced as back pain. So if you have a kidney stone, they often say they feel like they have back pain, but it can also be a sign of a kidney infection from pyelonephritis. All right, so the most common cause of urinary tract infections is actually normal flora. 95% of UTIs are caused by normal bio, biota of the GI tract, like E. coli and enterococcus, various enterococcus species. Entero means intestine, so enterococcus just means intestinal cocci. That's where they get their name from because they're common in the intestines. Another one is Staphylococcus saprophyticus, 
which is a skin bacteria. And it's actually one that we used in lab. Um, but it, it, this is really the only infection it ever really causes. So um, E. coli is really the major one. It causes like 60% or something of all urinary tract infections. Basically, these bacteria from the skin around the urethra um, get pushed up into the urethra. And the most common forms or sort of common mechanisms of this happening is either from improper wiping in females. So my funny story about this is when, um, so like, you know, as a girl, when you're a kid and you're learning how to wipe, they always say front to back. Um, and my husband, when we found out that we were having a daughter, that my 20 week ultrasound, they said, it's a girl. He panicked because he has sons. And he was like, <clears throat> Oh my God, I don't know how to be a daughter, uh, you know, how to be a dad of a girl. He's like, I don't even know which way to wipe. Is it back to front or front to back? And I was like, babe, calm down. Just don't get poop in the pee hole. That's like the whole thing. And, and because wiping incorrectly can lead to poop in the pee hole or E. coli in the urethra and cause a urinary tract infection. So it is important. Wiping properly is important. Um, a lot of people get it though from sex. So um, intercourse involves penetration of the vagina and bacteria on the surface around the vagina or on the surface of the penis can get introduced into the vagina that way. So a lot of times um, people won't get urinary tract infections until they become sexually active and then they start getting a lot of urinary tract infections. So um, some ways that you can prevent them are make sure you cleanse your genitals before and after sex. A lot of times the advice is to urinate for females to urinate after sex because that flushing action can help to um, flush out any bacteria that did get pushed up into the urethra. Um, <clears throat> watch, just basically wash your genitals very well. Drink lots of water, again, to encourage that flushing action of the urinary system. And don't hold in your urine for long periods of time. So basically urinate frequently and drink water so you need to urinate frequently. Um, the other really common form of urinary tract infections are the nosocomial infections and the, cath the catheter associated UTIs. So those are not necessarily in a hospital. There are people at home who are catheters, use catheters. So a catheter is a, is a thin rubber tube that gets fed up the urethra. And this is often, oftentimes patients in hospitals, it's like they're undergoing surgery, they need to be catheterized but also patients who have urinary issues may also need a catheter. Like if they have urinary incontinence, they may be catheterized sort of permanently um, and like in nursing homes and stuff like that. So the catheter itself being introduced into the urethra if it's not totally sterile can introduce bacteria and cause infection. So that's a specific sort of subset of UTIs. And it can sometimes be different organisms like from the skin rather than E. coli. So how do we um, figure out, how do we diagnose urinary tract infections? The diagnosis is usually done with either a urinalysis and or a urine culture. So urinalysis is when you pee in a cup and then they take a dipstick and stick it in the cup and it does tests for multiple things like glucose for diabetes and protein for preeclampsia and also can test for white blood cells or pus um, <clears throat> or bacteria. So that's usually done very quickly. You get results pretty much right away. Um, but they also may do a culture to try to determine what the organism is. So then in that case, they would stick a swab into the urine and swab a, you know, like a Petri dish and grow it in the lab or maybe do a gram stain in order to look for specific types of bacteria or maybe to test for antibiotic resistance or sensitivity. Um, so those are pretty standard. The treatment for urinary tract infections is going to be um, antibiotics. And the thing with the antibiotics for urinary tract infections is you have to pick a class of antibiotics that will make it to the urine. So the mechanism, when you take oral antibiotics, you swallow it, goes into the digestive tract. You usually don't digest it, don't change it anyway. You absorb it from the stomach or the intestines, and then it goes to the liver. And the liver will often process it into a different form. And then that form is what's active. And by the time it gets 
through the body and then to the kidneys, it's all broken down and what you're peeing out is some metabolic byproducts of the drug, not the intact drug. And so for a <clears throat> urinary tract infection, you have to make sure that the drug is still active by the time it gets to the urine and it's still intact. So sulfa drugs are usually the choice um, for urinary tract infections. Another thing you can take for a urinary tract infection that you can get over the counter is something called pyridium. Um, the brand name is Azo. There's a whole bunch of these products. And it's a urine, it's basically a urinary tract, um, what's the word? Like it's an it's a anti-pain. Anti, it's an analgesic. There you go. A urinary analgesic. And so it kind of numbs the urethra a little bit and just makes those really uncomfortable sensations of the burning urine and the urge to pee more bearable until the antibiotics kick in. It happens to be a dye that you pee, when it turns your pee like a reddish orangish color, like pictured here, which can be very disconcerting if you're not aware of that side effect, but it's also kind of pretty. Um, it's like a really, like a red orange color. Um, alrighty, on to another type of urinary infection called leptospirosis. So this one's pretty uncommon, like in the US, but it can happen under certain conditions. So this is a spirochete bacteria, uh, sort of that corkscrew shape. And um, the other spirochete we've talked about is Lyme disease is caused by a spirochete. So I guess one of the similarities here is that all spirochete diseases, they have this ability to go into a sort of a latent phase or to cause multiple stages of disease and into a point where they become untreatable. So you really have to catch it early on and treat it. Um, it comes from animal urine. So it actually has nothing to do with our urine or urinary system, really. It, it has everything to do with coming from animal urine. It does, can potentially affect the kidneys. So that's, I guess, why it's in this chapter. Um, but you get it when you basically come into contact with animal urine, like you step in it or swim in it. So you're probably thinking like, well, I don't like purposely step in or swim in animal urine. So I don't see how this is a problem. But water sources, of course, can be contaminated. And so like um, if you're swimming in open water, sometimes, it could have a high enough amount of animal urine to contain leptospirosis. The most common times that people get infected are after natural disasters when there's flooding and then the floodwaters contain a lot of parasites and stuff. So, um, but it can actually burrow through the skin. So you don't have to ingest it or anything, just basically skin expo, just like wading around in dirty water can give you leptospirosis especially if, they, if you have a skin abrasion, if you have a cut, an open cut, or like if you just shaved. So um, the prevention of it is to make sure you're wearing protective clothing when you're wading around in dirty water or swimming in dirty water, that you cover up any open wounds or lesions. You know, try just, just try not to, to wade around in dirty water if you can help it, especially like if you have flooding in your basement or something, make sure you're wearing like waders. Make sure you clean after that, that you wash with soap and water. And if you have any wounds, make sure you clean those and sterilize them. Don't touch dead animals. I mean, I feel like that's a given, but whatever. And then make sure you're consuming clean water as well. So the signs and symptoms of the disease are, you know, kind of nonspecific. You might have a fever, headache. You might get some red eyes, the so conjunctivitis. So that can be a telltale sign because that's usually conjunctivitis by itself, like an eye infection, doesn't lead to a fever and other symptoms. So if you have conjunctivitis and these other symptoms and you've been, you know, swimming in floodwaters, right? After like big flooding, sometimes like YouTubers will post pictures of them like wakeboarding in the street behind their truck or something. And all I think of is like, leptospirosis. So I do wonder if any of them ever come down with it. Um, you might have muscle pain, nausea, and, and vomiting. And then the spirochete can progress to a later stage where it invades the kidneys, the liver. It may cause neurological disease. And we see that with Lyme it sort of starts in the skin, but then it can progress to other tissues like the joints and the nervous system. So that's kind of 
a, a theme we're going to see with spirochetes that they invade to deeper diseases and caught and start affecting other organs. So you, if you have liver disease, you may see yellow skin, jaundice, and it can cause long-term disability or death. Usually in elderly persons are going to be the ones most susceptible to severe complications. But it is antibiotic treatable. The sooner you treat it, the more effective it is. And again, that's a that's a key thing with spirochetes, with Lyme disease, with leptospirosis, and we'll see later in this chapter with syphilis, treponema. Um, alrighty, so those are the urinary diseases. Now for the diseases of the reproductive system. Most of them are going to be sexually transmitted because that is the way that we have direct contact with the reproductive system is through sex. So the couple of exceptions that we'll talk about are vaginitis and prostatitis, but pretty much all of the others are sexually transmitted infections or STIs, formerly known as STDs, formerly, formerly known as venereal disease. All of those are synonymous terms, but the most correct one now is STI. Um, fun fact for you, STIs are actually more common in the U.S. than anywhere else. And in addition to potentially causing disease of the reproductive tract, they also contribute to cancer and to infertility. And so there's sort of multiple reasons to take care of these diseases. So um, preventing most of them, you can do with barrier contact. So here's my PSA, public service announcement, to use a condom. The diseases that we're going to talk about are the discharge diseases, so trichomoniasis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, which all involve, as one of their symptoms, potentially discharge from the penis or vagina. Um, we'll talk about genital ulcers, which are caused by uh, herpes viruses, and genital warts, which are caused by papillomaviruses, and then a couple of other random extra diseases. Alrighty, so let's start with gonorrhea. Gonorrhea was classically known as the clap, and there's all kinds of um, stories about where that name originated. I encourage you to Google that if you're interested in etymology. Um, but nobody really knows, I think, for sure why it's called the clap. But anyway, as a sexually transmitted disease, it was often, you know, prostitutes often got gonorrhea and chlamydia, two very common sexually transmitted diseases. So the causative agent of this disease is a bacteria. It's a Neisseria, Neisseria gonorrhea. So gonorrhea is sort of in the name, just like we had Neisseria meningitidis. Um, so both of those are diplococci, they're gram-negative diplococcus bacteria. One just likes the nervous system, the other likes the genital mucosa. So the signs and symptoms are pretty nondescript. You might have painful urination and you might have a yellowish discharge. 10% of infected males and half of infected females though are asymptomatic. So a lot of these infections go unnoticed, um, particularly in females. The way to diagnose it is through culture. And if you have like an annual gynecological exam, they basically every year when they do the pap smear, they also are checking and doing STD testing usually. So it's pretty standard. You can also, as a male or a female, request gynecologic or uh, STD testing. And so it's really just a culture that they do to look for um, gonorrhea. Um, the prevention of it is, of course, either not having sex or having protected sex using a barrier protection method like condoms and also having regular testing because you might be asymptomatic and regular testing will let you know whether you're infected or not and then you can treat yourself so you can not um, transmit it to other people but also not progress to worse infections. So there is antibiotic treatment, penicillin works just fine, but there are strains actually that are arising that are resistant. So that is on the CDC's sort of urgent threat list of resistant bacteria. Gonorrhea is a really um, common infection, and so common infections that are hard to treat is really dangerous and really scary. So there are complications of gonorrhea, 
in males, it can spread to the prostate gland and even up to the epididymis, which is like right on top of the testes and can damage them permanently and lead to infertility. Females, it can spread to the fallopian tubes, that's what salpingitis is, and the uterus, the pel so it can cause pelvic inflammatory disease that causes severe inflammation in the uterus or in the fallopian tubes, which can lead to infertility as well, or a predisposition to ectopic pregnancy, which is usually in the fallopian tube, where, where the fertilized egg implants in the fallopian tube and starts to grow there and you can't grow a baby in your fallopian, fallopian tube. So it can be dangerous to the mom and it requires surgery that usually involves removal of the fallopian tube, which then means they can't naturally get pregnant. Um, so that's a form of infertility. Uh, another thing that can happen with gonorrhea is you can end up with gonorrhea in the bloodstream, gonococcal bacteremia. And so it doesn't cause sepsis usually, it doesn't, um, proliferate in the blood, but it can use the blood as a, as a transportation to other tissues where it can infect the joints and cause chronic arthritis, or it can spread to the skin where it causes this weird rash and that's painful. So yeah, you really don't want, want to go around with untreated gonorrhea because it's asymptomatic usually until it causes a complication. So that's the, the problem with asymptomatic gonorrhea. It's not that you're just like a carrier and you never get disease. It's that you're a carrier for now and you end up with disease once it causes further damage. Another rare complication is gonorrhea is that it can spread to the heart and cause endocarditis or to the nervous system and cause meningitis. Um, so regular testing is really key, especially since so many cases are asymptomatic. Um, another very similar sexually transmitted disease in terms of symptoms and frequency is chlamydia. So chlamydia is the most common reportable infectious disease in the U.S. Not all diseases are reportable, but of the reportable ones, chlamydia is the most common. There's more than 1 million cases reported annually. And, uh, and I shouldn't say infectious disease. I mean sexually STI. It's the most common reportable STI. So um, the number of cases that are reported is not necessarily the number of cases that there actually are. And that's because so many cases of chlamydia are actually asymptomatic. So there's a lot of people out there that have chlamydia but aren't actually recorded. So the mo this graph here shows you the breakdown in terms of age groups by for men and women, what the most popular age groups are for chlamydia infection. And um, the most popular age group right here is the 20 to 24 age range. And we could even extend that and basically say the 15 to 19 age range and the 25 to 29 age range. So basically 15 to 29 year olds are the most commonly diagnosed with chlamydia. Um, and that's of course during the sort of sexually active, sexually exploratory year. So that makes sense. There's probably a lot of transmission during that time. It also means that if you're in that age group, you should definitely get yourself regularly tested because, again, so many cases are asymptomatic. So chlamydia is an interesting organism. It's a bacteria that is an obligate intracellular parasite, which means it must live in cells. So it's a bacteria, but it can't actually replicate outside of a cell. It has to infect a cell and it replicates inside the cell, and then it busts open and busts out of the cell and it continues, which is a lot more like the life cycle of a virus. So again, I guess if we like got back to that definition of life and what is a living thing, and viruses we often say are not living, but there are a lot of bacteria, not a lot, there's a handful of bacteria that kind of replicate life, but they are dependent on cells just like viruses are. But it's considered a bacteria because it still has a nucleus, or not a nucleus, it still has um, a membrane, um, and it still has cellular structures like ribosomes, and it has a chromosome. So it is a bacteria, but it's a bacteria that has lost the ability to replicate outside of cells. So it has to be inside of a cell. Um, it causes damage to cells. It also causes a, an immune response that, you know, release of cytokines that promotes inflammation and tissue damage. So in males and females, both, it can be asymptomatic, but if, if there are symptoms, it's usually 
painful urination and discharge, just like gonorrhea. In fact, there's a lot of times people have both chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, untreated infections can lead to more serious infections of the reproductive system. So in males, the epididymis, in females, the cervix or the fallopian tube, salpingitis. Um, another thing is that chlamydia can be transferred to newborns via the birth canal and they can cause serious eye infections that we talked about previously when we talked about eye infections that are much like a very serious form of conjunctivitis or keratitis and they can also cause meningitis in newborns so that's the disease they cause in newborns is pretty serious and that's actually why newborns are given eye drops at birth to prevent conjunctivitis that can be caused by chlamydia or gonorrhea um, if a child tests positive for chlamydia or gonorrhea, these are sexually transmitted diseases. There's really no other way to get them in the genitalia. So if a child presents to a doctor or an ER with you know, some symptoms and they test positive for gonorrhea or chlamydia, then that doctor will report um, the child as being a victim of sexual abuse. The diagnosis of chlamydia is usually culture or PCR, so there are ways to culture it in tissue culture, cell culture. There's also PCR tests for it, and the treatment is antibiotics. Gonorrhea and chlamydia are both very treatable. The problem is that they are both often asymptomatic until they cause damage and complications in the rest of, in the reproductive tract. Um, so it's important to get regularly tested for those things. Now, vaginitis and vaginosis, these are common but not serious in any way. So vaginitis is just inflammation of the vagina, and that can be non-infectious in nature, just like you might react, have like a reaction to a spermicide or some kind of lubricant, and that can cause vaginitis. Um, it's basically just inflammation that's, that causes itching or burning or discharge. and um, a very common cause of vaginitis is candida albicans. I'm sorry, I don't, here it is. Okay, so we'll talk about that. Vaginosis is a condition where basically you just have kind of like an off population of microbes and it can cause some annoying symptoms like smelly discharge, but it's not actually like necessarily pathological, doesn't cause any inflammation or disease or discomfort physically, but olfactorily it can. All right, so we're going to talk about candida albicans and gardnerella mostly. All right, so candida albicans is the yeast that is a normal flora in the vagina. And um, basically a yeast infection. I hate the term yeast infection because really what it is is a yeast overgrowth. It's a super infection. So it is when you um, have either a, due to a change in pH chemistry of the vagina, you kill off some bacteria or oftentimes after taking antibiotics, um, you kill off normal flora that does not kill the candida because it's a fungus. And so then the candida can overgrow and it causes inflammation and itching in the vagina. Um, and some women experience it like repeatedly, different hormonal changes can cause it. Sometimes women experience it after sex, like kind of like urinary tract infections, they get yeast infections frequently after sex, very common after taking antibiotics um and the treatment is antifungals i don't have it on here but there is a treatment for it it's antifungals they can be either in suppository form that you stick into the vagina like a cream or it can be oral um, antifungals um, vaginosis bacterial vaginosis literally is it's a term that means a condition of the vagina not infection or inflammation and so sometimes it's just abbreviated BV. And this is an overgrowth of a particular species of bacteria called the Gardnerella family. And they just happen to 
create a pro byproduct that has a very distinctive fishy odor, like tuna fish. And um, it can be that these species of bacteria can grow based on hormonal changes in the vagina can be, um, which can also be, and other chemical changes. So like sex, sometimes sperm or semen can change the chemistry of the vagina and lead to overgrowth of these Gardnerella species. Um, so it's just due to a shift from lactobacilli to more of these Gardnerella species. Some of the pathology that's that's um, correlated with Gardnerella species, so people who have bacterial vaginosis have a higher risk of palpatory inflammatory disease um, and ectopic pregnancies, but it's a very small increased risk. Um, people who test positive for BV, they can't get like an IUD. An IUD is an intrauterine device and it's, it's installed um, by going up the vagina and through the cervix. So if somebody has bacterial vaginosis, they won't do the IUD implantation because they're concerned they might bring some of those Gardnerella into the, into the cervix and that could cause inflammation. Um, so it's not considered sexually transmitted because you don't get it. It's not transmitted from one person to another, but it is often associated with sex because semen in the vagina can change the pH and change the chemistry of the vagina, which leads to this shift. So um, there is treatment for it. The treatment is usually antibiotics, though some people will claim that probiotics or dietary changes can help both in the female and potentially in her partner. Um, all right, other, oh, so this is still about Gardnerella species. So the, the diagnosis is either, well, it's both, clinical presentation, so the, the characteristic odor, but also st doing culture or staining vaginal, um, doing a swab and gram stain. Um, the treatment is antibiotics, and it's per really indicated for women who are trying to get pregnant or who want to use an IUD. It's not necessary for, you know, because it doesn't cause disease. It's not necessary in women if they don't want to treat it if the odor is not problematic or doesn't bother them um it's not uh you know disease causing but certainly if you want to try to get pregnant or have an iud it's in your best interest to to shift reshift those bacterial species um and then the third one that can cause vaginitis or another one that can cause vaginitis like candidiasis does is a sexually transmitted organism it's a protist Called Trichomonas, Trichomonas vaginalis. And again, there, a lot of uh, sexually transmitted diseases, unfortunately, have a tendency to be asymptomatic until they cause problems. So same as sort of with chlamydia and gonorrhea, a lot of Trichomonas infections are asymptomatic. There may be a discharge it's, sometimes it's white or green, different color maybe than chlamydia or gonorrhea. And of course, if the infection progresses, it can cause damage to the reproductive tract and cause infertility. Um, all right, so now for some that are, so we talked about inflammation of the vagina, vaginitis, now inflammation of the prostate, which is male specific. And this can be from um, infection usually from normal like kind of like a uti like normal bacteria that get into the prostate usually you know from a urinary tract infection so some of the symptoms can be um, urinary frequency so needing to pee a lot kind of like a uti needing to pee a lot at night painful burning urination um, difficulty urinating so if the prostate is swollen it kind of pinches off the urethra so it may be just difficult to get the pee out. Um, you may have pain in the abdomen or genital area. You may also have muscle or joint pain as a side effect. You may have fever and chills. You may have bloody or cloudy urine. Um, and it's really common at some point for men to experience prostatitis, usually in their later years. And it can be treated pretty easily with antibiotics. Um, now we're going to talk about some other STIs, sexually transmitted diseases, the genital ulcer diseases. 
So we're going to talk about syphilis and herpes, which both cause ulcers. Fun fact for you, um, HIV is not covered in this chapter because we covered it with the diseases of the blood because it um, infects white blood cells, but it is sexually transmitted, so it kind of has a role in this chapter. But um, because HIV infects white blood cells, any sort of damage or lesions in the reproductive tract actually increase your odds of getting HIV because it, if you have syphilis or genital herpes, you also have a lot of white blood cells in your genitalia that are trying to fight those. And so that's just basically food for HIV. So um, having other STDs actually increases your risk for contracting HIV. All right, so let's start with syphilis. Syphilis is caused by a spirochete, another corkscrew bacteria. So these little black curly things here um, are spirochetes on a, on a stain slide. And the spirochete is named Treponema pallidum. And it's similar to chlamydia in that it's a strict parasite. It won't grow outside of cells. It actually needs to grow in, needs cells in order to grow. And like we see with spirochete diseases, like Lyme disease and leptospirosis, is it goes through these stages. So there's the early stages and the later stages. So primary, secondary, and tertiary. So in primary syphilis, the telltale sign is this painless lesion called a chancre on the genitalia. So this is one on the penis, but you can also get it on the vagina. So it's just like this little lesion, but it doesn't really hurt. And it goes away on its own. So a lot of times people will not end up seeking medical treatment because maybe they like, they're like, oh, what's that? That's weird. Well, it doesn't hurt. And so then, and then it goes away. So like, I guess I don't need to call the doctor. I guess whatever it was, it got better. Um, and so then they progress to secondary syphilis. So that can happen anywhere from three weeks to six months after that chancre heals. And you, what happens in that stage is the spirochete actually spreads systemically to different parts of the body. So you can have a fever, headache, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes. But another characteristic sign is that you get this rash, this weird skin rash. I don't know how long it lasts, and I don't think everyone gets it. Um, but it is telltale and now can result in early catching of the disease and treating it. Because the disease is treated, it's treatable with antibiotics during this primary and secondary stages. And is often detected in those stages because there are signs of disease. So if they're, if they're found, then they get treated. The problem is after that secondary stage, it goes into a period of latency where there's no symptoms for years. And then you enter tertiary syphilis. So that can be like 10 to 30 years after that original chancre, um, where this, the syphilis, the treponema spirochete has invaded multiple organ systems and you can have multiple different symptoms depending on what organ systems have been affected. So this tertiary syphilis um, is untreatable and, and can be fatal. So some of the different um, forms of tertiary syphilis, you can have cardiovascular syphilis, where it causes damage to the aorta and to the blood vessels that can lead to aneurysms, and then they can rupture and you basically you know, bleed internally till you die. Um, you can have these tumors in, form these, these sort of tumors, these syphilitic tumors um, that can develop in the liver, the skin, the bone, the cartilage. They can be painful, they can be disfiguring. They can lead to death, but usually they're just really, they impair the function of that organ. And then a common form was neurosyphilis, where the spirochete infects the nervous system, cause headaches, but also can cause dementia. People would like literally go crazy. And it was like a thing, prostitutes, older prostitutes sort of losing their mind. Um, and uh, they often some they often called it uh, this disease in women. They called it hysteria. So they thought it it originated somewhere from the the uterus, which was semi true. But really, what it was was neurosyphilis. So these tertiary stages of syphilis are pretty rare today because we have effective treatment and and we often do get to treat patients in primary or secondary stage of disease. But before we had antibiotics, there was no treatment for syphilis. I'll come back to that one. So 
historically people understood that there was this disease and it, that it somehow was sexually transmitted and they didn't know how to treat it but sometimes they would do stuff like after sex they would use like a mercury rub or arsenic or they would drink arsenic which both of those things are totally toxic and probably killed people um, but there was there was no cure for it until the discovery of antibiotics and so penicillin is very effective treatment um, but for you know years and years syphilis was is a is a disease that i mean even probably biblical times i don't know if there's any biblical references to it but it's certainly an old disease that has been transmitted sexually as long as humans have been having sex potentially so the prevention of it of course is going to be abstinence or physical barriers like condoms and if you um, have a known exposure to just go ahead and start penicillin prophylactically to prevent infection or to prevent or, or to treat early stage infection. So another problem with syphilis is that it can be transmitted to a fetus or an infant, a newborn during um, like pregnancy and birth. So if uh, the fetus develops, if the spirochete infects the fetus, it can cause multiple types of birth defects. Again, this is fairly uncommon because this really happens when somebody has tertiary um, syphilis and and it's safe to treat syphilis during pregnancy if the mother has signs of, of primary or secondary infection. Um, but so this these complications again in modern day are fairly rare but were much more common before we had antibiotics to treat it. All right, another common se sexually transmitted infection, STI, this one's caused by a virus and it causes genital ulcers. So these, this is the genital herpes or herpes simplex viruses. So there's two, there's herpes simplex virus one and herpes simplex virus two, HSV one and HSV two. They can both, so one of them more, most commonly causes cold sores, which are lesions or ulcers on the mouth. And another one is more common at causing genital ulcers in the genitalia, the penis and vagina or vulva. Um, they can both do both. So you can transmit oral herpes to the genitalia and vice versa through oral sex. Um, <clears throat> herpes viruses, as we constantly are saying, have that ability to go latent. They can infect the nerves and then the skin rash or the skin lesion can go away, but you still have the herpes virus and it can um, recur, it can be reactivated and come back out and form the rash again. And different things can trigger that. Stress is a common one. Um, so it causes these painful vesicles, lesions, either on the mouth, in the mouth, or on the genitalia. A lot of times it's asymptomatic. It can go through latency periods that are asymptomatic where you don't have lesions. Um, a rare complication of herpes is that it can get into the nervous system and cause encephalitis, inflammation of the brain. Um, transmission, of course, is primarily through direct exposure. So that can happen sexually, but also it can happen through kissing. You can transmit it through kissing someone with an open lesion, a cold sore, or just come like the lesions aren't necessarily on the genitals themselves, but can be just around the groin or the buttocks. So, so basically just covering up those lesions and not directly contacting them. So um, with sex, either wearing um, uh, either abstinence or contact barriers like condoms or even just bandages covering up the areas of the lesions. Also infected mothers should be careful about kissing. If, they, if you have an, an active cold sore, don't kiss your baby um, or let them touch that cold sore. And if you have genital herpes, it might be indicative of, or the doctors might decide to do a C-section rather than a vaginal delivery to prevent the, the newborn from being exposed to the lesions. There is treatment. There is an antiviral called acyclovir that is very common. It can be used topically like a cream that you rub on, or it can be taken orally. Um, and it does decrease the length of time that the lesions are there and it reduces transmission, viral shedding and transmission. 
and can also increase those periods of latency and prevent recurrence. So it has been pretty successful. Um, the diagnosis of genital herpes is usually based just on the, the lesions itself, but um, those lesions can be tested. You do PCR antibody tests to look um, to make to confirm that diagnosis. The transmission to newborns is particularly dangerous. So in pregnant women, it's really important to do that testing because it can cause disease of the skin, the eyes, or the central nervous system, which can all be fatal, particularly those central nervous infections have an 80% mortality rate in newborns. So that C-section is usually um, pretty important in a mother, especially if she has active lesions. They definitely don't want to risk the baby getting a fatal infection. Um, general herpes is actually really common, or I should say herpes, both uh, the cold sore type and the genital type together, HSV1, herpes simplex. So it's estimated about 20% of Americans have herpes simplex virus one or two, which means that it would be more common than chlamydia but herpes is actually not a reportable disease. Um, another virus that can infect the genitalia is human papillomavirus. So human papillomavirus, I actually feel like should also be in the skin chapter because it's the common cause of skin warts, your everyday vanilla skin warts, but it can also cause genital warts. And more seriously, it can cause cancer of the genital system. And so that's why it's primarily found in this chapter. So it's a virus. There's actually a hundred, more than a hundred different types of HPV. Some of them cause skin warts and some of them cause genital disease. So there are different strains that cause each. So you can't get genital HPV from a skin wart. So like if your partner has a wart on their hand and touches your genitals, it's not going to give you cervical cancer or something. It's there. The cancer causing strains and the wart strains are different. The regular skin strains are different from the genital strains. Um, so the infection, if it doesn't cause warts, there's also the, some of these strains cause sort of silent infections of the genitalia that can lead to abnormal cell changes that cause cancer. And those are the ones that are really the most concerning health-wise. The warts, though, are not pretty, and the genital warts can look very different than sort of your classic skin wart. They have this sort of like very flowery, um, you know, overgrown sort of look and can be very unattractive. But the real important thing with HPV is its ability to cause cancer. So HPV is, and certain strains of HPV, I should say, are oncogenic. They are cancer causing. And something like 98% of cervical cancers have been determined to be caused by HPV. And it's possible those other 2% are organic, that somebody just has a genetic predisposition for cancer and they develop cervical cancer, or it could just be that the HPV wasn't detected in those. But certainly a vast majority, 98%, are caused by this virus. And specifically the strains HPV 16, 18, 31, 33, and 35 are the ones that cause cancer. They don't just cause cervical cancer. We've also found that they contribute to penile cancer, anal cancer, and mouth and throat cancer. So basically any of those mucosal membranes that become infected can also become cancerous. Cervical cancers are the most common type though. And that is because HPV produces two important virulence factors. They're called, they're proteins that are called E6 and E7. And the way they work is they work together to dysregulate the cell cycle. So basically to tell the cell to keep dividing. And usually when a cell um, cycle is like when there's a, a, an error in cell cycle regulation, the cell recognizes it and kills itself, commits suicide. But the second protein here prevents it from killing itself. So a cell, the E7 protein, inhibits a part of the cell that regulates cell cycle. So this PRB um, basically tells the cell to stop dividing. 
but E7 inhibits that. So the cell doesn't stop dividing, it keeps dividing. Normally, if the cell keeps dividing like that, it will self-destruct and do apoptosis. But E6, the second virulence factor, prevents it from committing suicide. And so therefore, with these two um, virulence factors together, inhibiting these two key proteins in the cell, it continues, makes the cell continue replicating. And that's what cancer is. It's cells that can't stop growing. Um, and so how do we detect it? We can detect this overgrowth of cells. Really what we're detecting is the cancer more so than the HPV. So annual exams, gynecological exams, involve doing a pap smear, which is taking a sample of cells from the cervix. So this is if you go in with a speculum and you're viewing the cervix, this is what a healthy pink cervix looks like. And they just take this little like pipe cleaner basically and take a scraping of cells that they put on a slide and send to a lab and the lab looks at the cells under the microscope. And so um, as the cells become cancerous, they start to change in the way they look. And so they can score or grade the cells. And if they're precancerous, um, then they can be removed. And oftentimes cancer can be prevented from developing further, but sometimes the cancer develops very quickly and you end up with cancerous cells that are just you know overpopulating the slide. So the cells can also be tested. You can do PCR-based screening to see if those cells are also infected with HPV and to see what strain they're infected with. But usually the test is just looking for an abnormal pap smear. So if you have an abnormal pap smear, then that basically means you have HPV. Um, but they may also do additional testing to test specifically for HPV. The good news is that there is a vaccine for HPV. It was approved in 2006. The original one protected against four types of HPV. And I was in one of that first cohorts. I got my HPV vaccine in 2006. Um, so I am protected against four types, but if you get it now, you actually are protected against nine types of HPV. Two that, cause, that commonly cause genital warts and seven of the ones that most commonly cause cancer. So the vaccine is um, controversial because it's recommended for teen, preteens between the ages of nine to 11 is when um, you're supposed to get vaccinated on schedule, which is designed that way because you should get the vaccine before you start sexual activity. And um, the vaccine is to prevent this STD that causes cancer, but a lot of parents have this idea that it is promoting sex, that it's sort of like condoms and safe sex talks, that if you, and, and birth control, that by giving it, you're actually promoting sex, which is not what it is. It's preventing a sexually transmitted disease that's incredibly common um, that, that people are susceptible to once they become sexually active. So it's best to give it at an age before most people become sexually active. And there are plenty of kids that become sexually active at 12, 13. And so even if parents want to think that their kid won't become sexually active until much later, still good idea to go ahead and get the vaccine well before that day comes. And it does not um, mean that they can or should become sexually active at that point. Um, so that's Gardasil. Um, it's not, I don't think it's required, it's not required, like it's not a required school age vaccine. It's an optional one that doctors recommend and so I don't think vaccination rates are that great because I think a lot of parents opt out, especially because it's associated with sex. And a lot of parents are like, well, my kid's not gonna have sex till they get married. And so they don't need this vaccine. But the truth is you can still get it from your one monogamous partner of a husband or wife. So still very necessary. All right, um, HPV itself, there are no antivirals for it. So there is no treatment for it. Um, what you can treat is the cancer. Um, so there's, you know, if you have an abnormal pap smear, sometimes they'll have to do a procedure to remove or scrape cells from the uterus. 
which is incredibly uncomfortable. I haven't gone through gone through it myself, but I know plenty of people who have. Um, it's very unpleasant, much more unpleasant than a couple of shots for a vaccine. And then, of course, if you develop cancer, the, the treatment, the surgeries, and the chemotherapy are even more intense and unpleasant. Um, so really, the treatment is just trying to detect, detect it early in infection and then remove infected cells to prevent cancer. So the vaccine is definitely preferable to that. And there is evidence that vaccines in especially countries that have high vaccination rates, that it is reducing the rates of cervical cancer. And uh, statistically significantly. All right, these last two diseases I feel like are kind of weirdly placed here in this chapter. This one in particular I feel like should really be in chapter 16 with skin diseases. So it's called Molluscum contagiosum and they look kind of like warts and you can have one or you can have several. Sometimes they're in the groin region so I guess that's why it's in this chapter. But it's not sexually transmitted, it's just contact transmitted. Or you can get it from fomites like a towel or something like that. Um, in this picture, you see a kid with it, so it's definitely not something sexually transmitted. It's a pox, it's a type of pox virus, so it really goes better with like smallpox and chickenpox. But it's almost more like a wart in the sense that it's just it just is a surface infection of the skin and it causes this overgrowth of the epithelial cells and these warts that have this indentation, kind of like smallpox did. But we don't have smallpox anymore. And again, smallpox would be all over the body. And this boy has a pretty bad um, set of molluscum contagiosum, but I've had this before. Um, my stepson has had this before. So it's just basically like these little dimpled warts. And the treatment is just like treating skin warts, which is to remove them via cryosurgery, like liquid nitrogen, or sometimes they'll do like a little injection of, anti, um, of anesthetic and then scrape it off. So it's just infecting that localized area of skin and you remove the lesion, you remove the virus, but they can recur. Um, so that's molluscum contagiosum. So if you ever get like a wart with a little dimple in it, that is technically molluscum contagiosum. It's still just a skin virus um, and treated the same way. And then this other one, GBS, group B strep. This is not particularly dangerous in healthy people. The danger comes in pregnant women. So group B streptococcus can cause fatal infections of the newborn. Um, it also can lead to infections of the mother after birth. She can end up with sepsis or infection, like self-infection by that group B strep. Um, it can also lead to preterm birth, um, but mostly the, the fear is infection of the newborn. So it's not pathogenic in women, like it doesn't cause vaginitis or anything. It's just a bacteria that 10 to 40 percent of U.S. women are colonized with in their vagina. And there's a small risk, but still a risk, very bad risk, of infants contracting life-threatening bloodstream infections or meningitis or pneumonia when they go through the birth canal. So the treatment is actually to treat women during labor. So usually they're tested towards the end of pregnancy. Um, in the later weeks, in the third trimester, they just basically a swap in culture and if they test positive for GBS then during labor they will be given IV antibiotics to kill the strep to prevent infection of the newborn and the since we have started doing IV antibiotics during labor for people with GBS we've reduced the incidence of neonatal disease by 200 fold so that's pretty significant um, a lot of women are really interested in like natural labor and drug-free labor, um, like no painkillers and stuff. But this one is one um, that I know a lot of OBGYNs, while, while they'll be supportive of like the, you know, no painkillers, they will really insist upon these IV drugs because the danger to the newborn is really significant and also to the mother a little bit. There's potential for it to cause sepsis in the mom as well. So that, those last two are kind of 
special, I suppose, in this chapter. They're not really STDs or urinary tract infection diseases. But that is the end of chapter 21 and the end of microbiology class.